Now, projection methods. Now, notice I, say, I call them projection methods for functional equations. And the fact is that uh, in much of dynamic economics or yeah, and other non-dynamic economics, what we are trying to do is solve for some unknown function. Um, not an unknown vector of prices, but an unknown function. Now, of course, dynamic programming, as we saw it on Tuesday, is also a case of where we're trying to solve for a unknown uh, function, the value function, and then also the policy functions. Now, in more generally in, in macro and um, uh, other uh, and life cycle matters, uh, we're looking for the consumption function. What, what is a person's consumption as a function of his wealth, age, uh, family status, et cetera? It's an unknown function. Uh, now, if you're doing asset pricing models, um, you would like to know what the price is of an asset given the state of uh, the market. Now also in dynamic games, you need to solve out for the strategies. And those are again, unknown functions. Now, the fact is that the, whole, the projection method, this uh, ser series of ideas that, un that come under the projection method is a very robust way of solving all of these kinds of problems. So basically, the, the ideas really are very general. Now, you saw many of the ideas in, in um, operation in dynamic programming, where we had an unknown value function, we had to approximate it. Now, the projection method looks at things from a more, a more general point of view mathematically, but also a much more general point of view in terms of economic applications. Uh, now, in particular, uh, pricing functions and asset pricing models, well, uh, there are models of asset prices where uh, people have private information. And then the, there has to be, the, that market price has to be a function of that distribution of information. But it has to, rep, it has to um, respect the fact that not everybody knows all the information. Um, and also strategies in dynamic games are, are, uh, have unknown functions of strategies. Now, um, back in the uh, um, mid-90s, I used projection methods um, to solve for pricing functions in asset pricing models where people had different information. Uh, my co-author on that paper, this was a was Tony Bernardo, who at that time was a graduate student um, here at Stanford. And uh, last uh, summer, he became dean at the Anderson Business School at UCLA. Uh, and of course, uh, fate dealt him uh, uh, <laughs> a tough deck. So, um, so that, and then also um, um, students of mine and uh, colleagues and I have, of mine have used uh, projection methods to solve dynamic games. So the key point here is that once you have properly defined your problem as one involving unknown functions, th then projection methods are, can be applied. Um, as, but first you have to understand the math of your problem. Now, what we're going to do first is look at the very simple functional equation of the differential equation, y prime uh, minus y equals zero. Now, sometimes you write it as y prime equals y. That's fine, too. Um, and now, remember, with differential equations, you also have to give it an initial condition or some kind of condition. You have to tell it what the value of this unknown function is at one point. And uh, you can think of this as being an initial condition. And so what I'm saying is that when at x equals zero, y is equal to one. Now the unique solution to that is of course, um, 
uh, y equals e to the x. Now, what we're going to do is so use projection methods to solve this differential equation for the interval 0, 3. Now, um, I, the lecture I gave a few weeks ago on finite difference methods, you could also use finite difference methods to solve for this differential equation. Actually, that sounds like a good exercise. Um, <clears throat> Finite difference methods, however, basically take, you have your space X, which is a continuous domain, and then what you do is you replace the domain with a discrete subset, a finite discrete subset of X values, and then you replace um, the differential equation with some difference equation. Basically, Y prime is replaced with a difference. Um, and so then finite difference methods discretize the problem um, in terms of the state space. Now we're not going to affect the state space. Our x in this approach will always be a continuous variable. But what we're going to do is approximate this unknown function by finite combinations of known functions. So by doing that, we do reduce the dimensionality from an infinite dimensional problem to a finite dimensional problem, but in a very different way than difference, uh, a difference, uh, finite difference methods do. Now, first of all, in order to understand how this is a functional equation, we write it as an operator. So L of Y is defined to be Y prime minus Y. So L is an operator. Um, yes, it happens to be linear, but that's an accident um, that I used the letter L. Now, what, what is L? L is an operator. And if you feed Y into L, then it's gonna spit out a function Y prime minus Y. And that's true for any Y. For any Y, this operator will take, it will, will spit out Y prime minus Y. Uh, so it's a mapping of functions to functions. Um, basically, it assumes that the y going in is c1, and uh, the y coming out is certainly going to be c0. You can't guarantee that it's going to be c1, because uh, if, if y is only c1, then its derivative is only going to be c0. So, um, by the, so this mapping is not a... We're not going to be doing a fixed point mapping here, because we're taking functions in one domain and mapping it into a set of functions in another domain. Um, so this is, we, we're not looking for Ly equals Y. Um, so what we do is we define the set Y to be all functions that are C1 and equals equal one at x equals zero. So that's what, that's a, a set, that's a set of functions. It is a, an affine set. It is not a vector space. Because if you take two y's from this set and you add them together, well, y zero of the sum is gonna be two, it's not gonna be one. So this is what we call an affine set, not a vector space. Um, now, if you subtract out one, then the remainders come from a vector space, but this y itself is not a vector space. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider the family of approximations called y hat. Now, the way I tend to write this is y hat is to be thought of as a function of x with parameters a. And so here I set y hat x of a is the following family. It's one plus, and then a finite sum of powers x, x squared, x cubed, et cetera, up to x to the n. Now, no, by the way, so much of the time when you're um, reading through um, anything I write, as well as stuff other people write, you need to pay attention to, um, does j start at one or does it start at zero? Here it starts at one because, see, if j equals zero, then x to the zero is one. Well, I already have that constant component that's here. So this is just adding up 
uh, powers of x from first power to nth power. Now again, this is an affine subset of the vector space of polynomials. Now, why do I have this one sitting here? Well, because now for any for any function uh, that's represented this way, well, when x equals zero, the function is going to be one, no matter what the coefficients a are. So we know that uh, um, well, we know that y hat x, I should change that to an x, is in this set for any, for any a. Because, so now sometimes, so this is a way of dealing with that initial condition. I just define the space of functions I'm looking at as a set of things that satisfy the boundary conditions. And now the objective now is to find some coefficients such that y hat x, with parameters a nearly solves the differential equation 11.1.1. Uh, now let's go back up. Now, by the way, y hat is re y hat really has is a function of x and a. Okay. So it's not, but in talking about this for our for in our purposes, a is a set of parameters, and what we're really interested in is y hat as a function of x for a fixed, some fixed a. Now, okay, so we start with this L operator. And now we're gonna to try to find um, uh, something, oh, 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 I messed up here. <laughs> if we define, yeah, yeah, I should make this point here. If our differential equation is the same as finding a y such that ly equals zero, that's the way, it, that's why we write this up in this way is that you have this operator and then you define the operator so that the solution to the functional equation is such that, um, that y is mapped to zero. So uh, this, is, this is like in, the, in um, general equilibrium, you have your excess demand function and you're trying to find prices which drive that to zero. Now, we create a residual function. Now, suppose we take an arbitrary y hat and we hit it with the L operator. Well, y hat has a set of coefficients a, and so then um, L of y hat um, is going to be minus one plus this uh, polynomial. So that's the, now why do I call that the residual function? Well, because remember L, we wanna find a Y such that L maps Y to zero. So any deviation from zero is, uh, tells you that Y is not, does not satisfy the equation L Y equals zero. And now in general, um, L of Y hat is also gonna be a function, which is a deviation of, um, L y hat from the target of the zero function. By the way, back here, when I say L y equals zero, I mean zero as in the zero function. Now that may seem a little strange. I mean, the zero function is a, is a function that's zero at every point X, and, but, but it is a function. It's, you shouldn't think of it as being a scalar, um, but it is a function and it's the zero function. <clears throat> and so now um, what we're trying to do is, <coughs> sorry, find a, a coefficient set of coefficients A such that the residual for that given A is nearly the zero function. Now, uh, the, notice I put good and nearly in the in quotations. That's because I, those, those are not math terms and I have to give that meaning. Now, we're gonna see the meaning by looking at, okay, we're gonna look at how this example continues. Now, if y prime minus y, if we're looking at the differential equation, then, and we're taking, um, uh, let's just go, um, yeah, a cubic polynomial, uh, over the interval zero, three. 
So that's your y height, y hat function given coefficients a. Now, one way to proceed is to say, well, you know, we want that residual function to be close to zero. Um, so why don't we just square the residual function? So at each x for get for fixed a, this is now fixing a. Look at this. This is fixing a. Um, then we have a function, residual function of x. Let's square that. That tells us what the total squared residual is for a given a. And then what we're trying to do is find the coefficients a so that um, the um, sum of squared residuals, the integral of squared residuals is minimum. So this is just, this is just like regression. Um, least squares, what we're trying to do is find some coefficients so that um, a, so that this residual function squared is um, uh, close to zero. So this, uh, no, notice that we're minimizing an L2 norm of the residual function. So it's minimizing a norm of the residual function. We chose L2 because we all understand how to do that, but perhaps there are better other norms that could be used. But for now, we just stay with L2. Now, when you write all this down, you see the thing is that every, it's, everything's a polynomial, everything's trivial. You can actually do this integral by in closed form, solve out for this, um, uh, this integral, and then you get a quadratic function in A, and here you have, a, you end up with a um, linear equation in the A when you take the first order conditions. And, uh, and then that gives you some numbers. I'm, I'll show you the actual coefficients later. But the point is that when you take the, um, when you take the sum of squared, integral of squared residuals and then uh, look at the first order conditions for minimizing over A, you get this set of uh, equations, which by the way, um, Notice that it is a symmetric matrix, uh, which of course it is since it comes from a quadratic objective. Now, another idea here, which again is the same idea as one you use in econometrics, is you say, well, you know, if the residual function is zero, then its inner product. With any, with any function is also going to be zero. That the inner, if, if the residual function is zero, then you take the residual function times any function f, well, that's going to be zero, and so the integral is going to be zero. So how are we going to identify the three unknown coefficient a's? Well, we pick three functions. You know, this is basically a projection. So what we're doing is, you know, this is projecting the residual against F. So what we do is we project the residual against um, uh, the first three powers of X. X to the zero, which is one. So that means that the integral of the residual should be zero. And then X to the first power and X to the second power. So basically what we're saying is we're going to identify the A's there are three A's, so we're going to put in three of these projection conditions um, in order to pin them down. Now you do the, the math for that, and you get this linear equation for the three unknown coefficients. Now, <laughs> here's a different idea. It doesn't look a whole lot different here, but the key thing is that in our approximation, we have three basis elements of the approximation, three functions which have uh, coefi unknown coefficients. And those are the basis functions of the approximation. And those basis elements are x, x squared, and x cubed. So now the Galerkin method says that you should form the projections of the residual function against the basis elements. Now the basis elements are powers of x, but the, but the basis consists of x to the one, x to the two, x to the three. So this is, um, looks like the previous idea of method of moments, except this is now a projection. And so we don't have x to the zero here. We have um, x one, the one x squared and x cubed. 
those are the three uh, directions in which we project. And they're motivated by the fact that those are the basis functions we're using uh, to approximate. Now, by the way, you crank through this, you get another uh, linear equation. Uh, you know, get, I get tired of seeing the linear equations. but Now, notice that all of those methods before require you to compute an integral. Well, if you know calculus, that's pretty trivial to do in all those cases. But some, sometimes, let's say, uh, you, maybe the integrals aren't so easy. Then you come to the idea of collocation. The idea is if the residual function is supposed to be zero everywhere, then it should be zero at, at each point. So what we do is we pin down the coefficients A by finding three points, three points of three X values. And, and so he, and we chose a uniform grid here. Not, that's not a good idea generally, but we, we're going to do it here. Um, and now we say, okay, what is the residual function at X equals zero? We want that to equal zero. And what it is, is it equals minus one plus a one. The residual function at one and a half and three are these um, conditions. And so now again, oh, there's a, should be an equal zero here. So basically the residual function equals that should, we want it to equal zero. So now we got three equations and three unknowns. Now, we saw before that um, if you're trying, now by the way, that's, that's, that's very much like, like it, well, it is the same as interpolation. Somehow you're thinking <clears throat> that if we can pick the A's down, A's, so that the residual function is zero at these three points, well then <clears throat> you're basically assuming that um, I have these three points on the curve and I'm doing kind of like an interpolation. And so I'm going to approximate, I'm going to say, well, then the residual function is approximately zero. Um, now, of course, we've learned that uniform points are not a good way to do interpolation. So they're also not a good idea to do this implicit interpolation. A better idea would be to use a, the three Chebyshev zeros of the cubic Chebyshev polynomial, um, that gives you these three numbers. By the way, um, uh, the, this, this looks not so clean, but that's because it's been adjusted, adapted for the interval zero, three. And so these are three numbers um, uh, in, on the interval zero, three. Now then again, now using these three points, you now find that uh, you get three linear equations uh, for the residual function, different than the previous set, but you have, again, three uh, equations and three unknowns. Now, here's um, the solutions. We have uh, five schemes, least squares, Galerkin, Chebyshev collocation, um, uniform collocation. Optimal L2, by the way, is one way, we know that the solution is e to the x. So we, we, we and what we're trying to do is approximate this, e, this solution e to the x with a cubic polynomial. So it's nice to see what the optimal cubic polynomial is from a least squares point of view and what its coefficients are. And that's to help us, um, see at, because that tells you, the, that gives you an absolute minimum, uh, I mean, that, tell, that solution, that cubic approximation of the exponential will be the absolutely best possible uh, cubic polynomial. And so we like to know if we're getting close to it. Now, um, and now notice that these, that these coefficients uh, are very different. Um, again, that's because um, in all these cases, I mean, the basis functions x, x squared, x cubed are not orthogonal. And so the coefficients, um, the coefficients on the individual ones don't matter, don't tell you much. Now, this is what matters. So we know the true solution. So what we do is we take our approximate solution 
And then we take the difference between it and the true solution and then ask what is the L2 norm of that error. And now I'm going to use scientific notation that I've, I mean, that I've, you've seen before. So um, when you use uniform collocation, uh, the um, L2 error, basically the integral of squared residuals, is 5.3 times 10 to the zero. Well, that's 5.3. Chebyshev collocation is 2.2. Well, gee, well, that's better. Um, Lee squares is 3.2. Well, that's, um, no, nah, that's interesting. Notice that Glurkin is uh, basically um, uh, uh, point, 0 0.53. So that's better than any of these others. The best polynomial has an L2 norm of uh, 0 0.17. So of all of these, Glurkin is the best. Um, and, you know, now what happens as we increase the degree of the polynomial? Well, each method gets better as you do higher and higher order of polynomial. By the way, with, with uh, all of these methods, um, as I, if I go to uh, degree not n polynomials, I'm looking at using 11 points. Um, in the collocation and um, and then uh, the collocation ones are going to use 11 points because they're going to be in basically interpolation. Now notice that uniform collocation is getting better, but slowly better. Chebyshev collocation is getting better, but at a faster rate. And in fact, at uh, degree 10 polynomial, it's about 100 times, it's two orders of magnitude better. Least squares is also 10 to the minus 8 and Glurkin is 10 to minus 8. So least squares in Glurkin is better than Chebyshev collocation. And by the way, the best degree 10 polynomial is uh, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 8. So Glurkin almost gets to the best possible. Well, Glurkin and least squares almost gets to the best possible. And Chebyshev collocation is a bit, is, it's also very close to the best possible. Um, uniform collocation is a hundred times worse. <coughs> so, again, uniform grids aren't good. Um, so this is this is the very simple example. It's a linear differential equation, but you're starting to see the ideas that we're going to be talking about. Um, now, let's do another example. A uh, single sector. Uh, one sector growth model that you've seen too often. There, the unknown function is the, what is consumption at time t? Well, consumption at time t is the consumption factor applied to the capital at time t because it's a stationary problem. <coughs> consumption function is the same um, at all time. Now, the consumption function has to satisfy the Euler equation. Remember, this, this is the Euler equation. But now, or, this Euler equation is written in the time domain. It's consumption at time t versus consumption at t plus 1 and the capital stock at t plus 1. And then this is also the time domain. Now, writing out this kind of dynamic problem in the time domain is very natural. Uh, formulate it, but then when you want to do the computation, you are really working with the functional form of the problem. What annoys me a lot when I read papers is that they write down the time domain form and I never see the function, what exactly the function is. Now, in this example, it's clear that the unknown is consumption and that the state variable is k, and that consumption is a function of the, st of the state k. In a lot of papers, you have, to, you have to scratch your head and wonder you know, exactly what are the state variables, um, and you should make it absolutely clear what it is. Now, the Euler equation translates into this functional equation, and yes, it is an ugly thing. 
Um, uh, you know, you have to uh, don't look at it too much. But the key thing that makes it really ugly is that <clears throat> okay, you prime C of K. Okay, that's fine. That's natural. I'm given that today's capital stock is K, then consumption today is C, and then margin utility is U prime of this. Now then, we want to have marginal utility of consumption tomorrow. Well, consumption tomorrow is, a, is consumption tomorrow's state variable, but tomorrow's capital stock is today's output minus today's consumption. And so that's why that's there. And so now you get a composition, you get C is applied to itself. So there's a composition thing going on here. And similarly, F prime is applied to F minus C. Now, I don't like looking at this kind of messy thing. So I will just say that this is an operator and that takes an arbitrary function C and at any particular capital stock K, here's its value. So this is an operator that takes any, um, uh, okay, it takes any, okay, okay, C zero plus, um, actually, I, it takes uh, C zero plus is a space of functions. The C here means constant, the continue, continuity class. C here means consumption, so sorry for that confusion. <clears throat> so it takes um, uh, basically any function that's uh, a positive function and maps it into the space of, and it, that, that's not, that's just C zero. The, the plus shouldn't be there, sorry. And then operator says solve for, find the C such that um, N of C is zero. Now, some sometimes thinking, thinking in this operator way is is maybe seem a bit clumsy but basically that is the key thing here you got you have to think about it as an operator you're trying to find unknown functions there's an operator that and the definition of equilibrium is to find some value for the unknown functions such that the operator maps it to zero now what we're going to do is our c hat is going to be a, a degree n polynomial um, and so again, what we're going to be doing is trying to find coefficients A that do a good job of satisfying, uh, of mapping, of near mapping C hat nearly to be zero. Um, now, so what do we do? Okay, now it's okay. We need to compute a residual function. So the operator, see, basically, this is nothing more than the operator N applied to the function c hat evaluated at k um again it's, uh, it's ugly but the thing is that you have a residual function for any coefficients a you have the residuals are now how can we solve out for uh the solution to the coefficients a well what we could do is take the residual function square it and then integrate it over a domain of the k's uh, the capital stock that we're going to be looking at, and then um, minimize um, the the integral of those of those squared residuals. Now, what we could do is we could take now. By the way, notice up here. Oh, okay. Up here, it's an ordinary polynomial, <coughs> um, but more generally, um, oh yeah, that we stay with that. Now then. A Galerkin is going to take zero out the averages or projections of Euler equation errors. So, with a Galerkin method, you're going to find you're going to have n weighting function psi, and then you're going to project the residual function against um, some uh, weighting function. Um, which, by the way, since the weighting function should be positive everywhere. Um, so that's a Galerkin. You pick some projection directions and then you uh, set the little a's to be a group of a's that um, causes the residual function to be orthogonal to all of the uh, test functions. Now, the, now collocation is basically where we pick endpoints and we just create a set of nonlinear equations. Um, so that we say, well, then at 
find some vector A such that uh, the residual is zero at those collocation points. Now, this is, now we gotta got do, this has more serious um, computational problems because now the exact integration is not possible, certainly not for the problem I just described. You have to use quadrature formulas. And what you want to do is use good quadrature formulas. Some people love using Monte Carlo, which is a horrible idea because then you have, uh, that creates a lot, very large errors. Um, there are some other methods called number theoretic methods that are also very good for large dimension. There's also a Smulyak um, uh, methods for integration. Um, basically, you need to find, once you've chosen the domain for K, you need to find some good integration formula over that domain. Now, if you're going to do collocation, well, then that's, that's much nicer because if you just have a, you have this ugly thing, but you just evaluate a finite number of points and solve for the coefficients. There, the problem is that the Jacobian may not, we want it to be well conditioned, but that will not always be true. Now, uh, as long as the problem is uh, decently conditioned, Newton's method, you can use Newton's method to solve it. Um, and, uh, and quadratically convergent. Now, notice that the value function iteration is not, or time iteration, nothing, no, none of those iterative schemes have anything to do with this approach. You just use Newton's method. There's no economic intuition behind using Newton's method. It's just known that that's a good way to solve nonlinear systems of equations. And um, if you insist on using uh, a method to solve for the coefficients that represents some economic intuition, well, you're, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be doing some things enormously wasteful. Now, homotopy methods are also possible um, to do. You could try least squares, you know, basically just some, choose A's to minimize the sum of squared projections or you know, residuals anyway. That could be ill condition, but those are, those are the things you have to think about. Now, once we have some solution, see, here's what's going on is we're trusting that these methods, quadrature methods and nonlinear equation methods, we trust that they can give us a solution, but then we verify. Uh, do, do pernier, no provenier. I've, I've got to practice my Russian. Trust, but verify. This is now the verification step. Now I ask you, how many times have you seen a computational paper in economics where they did something to verify that the answer is acceptable? Very, very seldom. Um, and if they're not my student, I think uh, never. Um, so, uh, or they use tests of accuracy that are very, have little power. Now, so what we're gonna do is we're going to rewrite the Euler equation error into its uh, marginal rate of substitution version. And so this, well, this is a rewrite of the Euler equation error. Basically what happens is that we're taking U prime inverse to the right-hand side and then, so now the top and the bottom are both in units of consumption. So now, this is a measure of how non-optimal the consumption function is. Now, if, if, this is, if this error is something on the order of one, well, then that's not good. Now, if this is 10 to the minus five, then what that says is that um, if e to, the, e to the k is 10 to the minus five, then that means that uh, people are messing up in their optimality. It's, the error is like about one part in 10,000. And that's about as good as people can do. So that's the acceptable sort of stopping rule. Once you find, once you found something so that um, the, the, Euler, the relativized Euler equation error is about 10 to the minus five, you're fine. Now notice this is unit free. 
And that's key. Your bounded, okay, I say bounded rationality, accuracy measure, I don't, um, it's bounded rationality, it, that's a phrase I used um, 30 years ago. Um, I mean, I don't mean to be invoking any economics papers on bounded rationality. I'm just saying it's, this is a measure of just how irrational, how non-rational this consumption function would be. And uh, we know people aren't gonna solve this perfectly. If you've got something that's 10 to the minus five, then yeah, that's a good prediction of how people are gonna behave. Now then, uh, once we have the error function, we want to define the LP norm. Now, uh, and sometimes we want to look at the L infinity norm. So this error, what you see, this is the tough one. L infinity error, the L infinity norm is the maximum value of this error. Okay, so, so that's a tough criteria. And, but when the examples I'll show you, I've been able to squeeze the max down to 10 to the minus five. Numerical results, yes, it's fast, fast, fast. Um, but, and that was even using computer 30 years ago. Now here's the general projection method. You have some functions H, which represent decisions, which represent price rolls, whatever it expresses. These are unknown. And, uh, but they are functions of the state X. And these are all, these are all possible functions there. But now you, equilibrium is described as there being some operator um, such that the operator, when H is the equilibrium solutions, that operator will map it to the zero function. Um, so we need to approximate the function H. Well, how are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna go back to standard basic approximation. We're gonna pick a basis of functions. And then with that basis comes an inner product. So we have a set of functions and an inner product that's appropriate for it. Um, so like if you have a compact domain, one appropriate uh, collection of functions are Chebyshev polynomials. If you have a, uh, <clears throat> an infinite domain, uh, then the uh, Gauss-Hermite polynomials are appropriate, and then with the with their corresponding inner product. Now, and the inner products are typically of this form, um, basically the, the integral of, of the weighted uh, integral of f times g. And so the basis should be complete in the space of C zero functions. Uh, it should basically it should be the basis should be flexible enough so that it, it, it you can approximate these unknown functions with um, with functions in this space. It would be nice if they were orthogonal with respect to the um, the inner product norm. You also want the norm to be easy uh, to compute, and also you want things to match up for the problem. Thing, the basis should be appropriate for the problem. Now, what we're trying to do, we come up with an H hat um, such that uh, uh, it's gonna be approximation. So now we, the unknown H lies in an infinite dimensional space. Uh, we now are transforming the problem into a finite dimensional space. We haven't discretized the state, no. We have discretized the uh, problem in the spectral domain. So what could the basis be? Uh, it could be ordinary polynomials, we, uh, trigonometric, degree Fourier, if your problem is periodic, which is not, doesn't happen often. If your, product is, if your problem is not periodic, then Chebyshev polynomials are appropriate. Legendre, step func test, you know, basically a lot of functions. And this list is gonna get longer with time. Uh, oh, now those are, those are linear approximations. That's where you approximate a function as a linear combination of basis functions. Now, we could go nonlinear. We could have some functional form phi of x with parameters a, and uh, okay, so this is arbitrary general nonlinear parametric form, and examples are neural networks and rational functions. Rational functions being polynomials divided by polynomials. Those are examples 
of a nonlinear problem. So again, we need to find coefficients a such that h hat uh, nearly solves um, the operator equation. Now, this was written, uh, oh, many years ago. These are promising directions, uh, but the tools of linear functional analysis and approximation are not really available for that. Now, however, as you'll see um, next week, uh, neural networks are possible to use um, now, and it's because we have this, uh, we understand neural networks much better than we used to. There still is no decent theory, uh, but we understand it well from a practical point of view. And so um, we, and, and there's very good software for it, um, for using it. So we, now people are starting to solve economics problems with neural nets. Uh, one of the first papers that I know of um, was by um, uh, Sergey and Lilia Maliar, uh, and I'll be uh, posting um, links to their stuff. Uh, they, they, did, they did this a couple of years ago, um, and there's video of a lecture of theirs. So um, uh, that's, I, I think, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was the first work using neural networks. Some of you may have seen a recent paper by Jesus uh, uh, Fernandez Villaverde, and um, that's, a, that's a very bad paper, particularly compared to the Molière's paper. Now, once you have decided on the operator and now an approximation, you'll often find that the operator itself needs to be approximated in order to give, but then you end up with a, some residual function that can be computed. And then what we want to do is find some, some vector a so that the residual function is small with respect to this inner product norm. And again, you have least squares because the quadratic objective is just inner product of a residual function with itself. You have Galerkin method of moments, collocation. Orthogonal collocation is where you use um, the zeros of your basis elements. Um, as collocation points. <clears throat> so, uh, and this is just the general version of what I showed you before. Again, you have, you have to do integration. Uh, you have to worry about not the nonlinear equations being be well behaved. Um, okay, so that's that. Now, here's another approach that um, I've been thinking about for many years and actually <clears throat> have started to implement. Suppose you want to do L1 minimization. Suppose you want to find the coefficients A so that you minimize the integral of the absolute value of the residual. So this is L1 minimization. Now, that's, a, that's not easy, but what you can do is first reformulate it. Um, what you do is you, you you pick a finite set of points xi, and then uh, you um, oh this okay, and then you introduce some uh, bounds uh, lambda bound, and so you choose the bounds and the coefficients a. I should have put a lambda here. You choose the the, the lambda bounds and the coefficients a, so as to minimize. Uh, the sum of these lambda bounds. Now, all the lambda bounds are not negative. Now, you see, why do we do this? Well, if the residual function is zero, then you can't, at some a, then you can make the lambda i, lambda i is equal to zero, and heck, that's a solution then. So what you're basically trying to do here is you pick a set of points xi, and what you want to do is find coefficients that sets the residual function equal to zero at all of them, and then, so you write down these inequalities because you typically are going to have uh, more points xi here than you have coefficients a. So uh, you write down this inequality. You're, there's not going to be a vector a that really solves this exactly. But what you want to do is minimize the sum of the magnitude of the deviations, and that's L1. Now, what's nice about this is you have now re this 
began kind of like a co-location method, which was equ nonlinear equations. You've now transformed, you mean co-location could be written as this, where the number of lambda i's equals the number of a's, vector, or, <clears throat> but then this is been written in a constrained optimization point of view. But now once you have it written in a constrained optimization point of view, then you can add all, you can do, you can be over identified. Uh, so you have more X's than A's. You uh, can impose conditions on A, which then Im which imply properties of your solution. Also the initial guess is not important. Um, you just pick some very big lambdas and no matter what your initial guess is for A, this, this will start in, a, in the feasible region. So that's L1 minimization. A convergence theory on this, there does, there exists some convergence theory, but not much of it uh, that I've seen is applicable to economics. Now, then I'm going to quit, okay. I looked through this example of partial differential equation. I suspect that some of you have never solved a partial differential equation. Um, you may understand that this is a partial differential equation. It's a heat equation. Uh, theta is a function of x of x space and time t, um, and this is so the first derivative uh, with respect to time is going to equal the second derivative with respect to space, and and so then and now at time zero we say we start with a sinusoidal uh, function. Um, now even though you know nothing about so let's let's say you know nothing about solving this, um, except that somebody told you that the true that the true solution is this. Now, what can you do? You just follow what I taught you. You have two variables. So you, you know what at t equals zero, you know what the answer is. So then um, that pins down the initial condition. And then for all other, for the later t's, you just write out this um, multivariate um, optimization um, um, functional form. Uh, then, um, um, yeah, so this is, yeah, X minus, yeah, X, yeah, it is X, X, yeah, X minus X to the ith power. So the initial condition is imposed there. So it's automatically true. So now maybe you could use orthogonal polynomials here, whatever, but anyway, <coughs> stay with the polynomial version. Residual is a function of space and time. And so now <coughs> you have m times n coefficients. And so all you have to do is pick m times n. Well, you, here you want this residual to be um, zero for a whole bunch of test functions. Um, or you could pick uh, n times m uh, uh, collocation points and you solve it. So even though you've never seen a differential equation before, that you, the method to solve it, you've solved it. Another example that you should look through is one on computing conditional expectations. And I think this is a great example of where um, projection dominates uh, what most people would intuitively do by, through some Monte Carlo simulation. Now, what I wanna do now is, um, uh, okay, let's see what I'm, okay. Okay. Um, so I'm going to close that file. Now what I'm going to do is, um, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. Show you an example that's fully worked out. I have two such examples and I think I have time to do it. Um, okay, by the way, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. Doria no Proverie. Um, actually, yeah. That's, that's, uh, thanks for the, 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 the Russian lesson, so. Um, yeah, okay, so let me take a break, sip of my uh, liquid diet here, and are there any questions or comments? There's a lot of material, uh, so if, you have, if you're confused along the way, tell, ask me now.
Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do that simple growth problem. So here's a production function, Cobb Douglas production function, and I'm gonna define, yeah, um, I'm gonna define the production function and also F prime, which is the marginal product. I'm also gonna do utility and then um, util utility prime also. Here's the parameters I'm gonna choose. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, and this is done in the JET paper. By the way, after this lecture, you should go back and read, you go back and read the JET paper because this is mostly, <coughs> I mean, um, this, this presentation is based mostly on what's in the JET paper. And then in the JET paper, I expand a lot on many points. Um, so do read that. One thing I do is now you might say, well, the the Euler equation is u prime c today equals a beta u prime c tomorrow, et cetera. Well, what I did is I I basically replaced the the equation with where u prime we had u prime c. What I did is I took u prime inverse to both sides, and so now I have consumption is equal to u u prime inverse applied to the right-hand side of the Euler equation. Um, now this, so now then, I'm, I'm going to approximate C uh, with a linear combination of polynomials, so that's gonna make the problem linear in the unknown coefficients. Uh, this is also going to, you see, the UT prime inverse is gonna unwrap some of the curvature in um, utility prime, so in U prime. So th that also has a tendency, to reduce the curvature. I'm gonna choose a range. Um, I'm gonna choose a polynomial degree. So the range is 0.25 to 1.75. Degree is three, and so I'm gonna do a degree three. Um, or, I'm gonna do ordinary polynomials. Uh, things go better with Chebyshev polynomials, but let's just stay with ordinary polynomials <coughs> because that, um, to keep the notation simpler. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct the collocation grid, however, will be the Chebyshev zeros on the range. Um, because basically, we saw, we saw before that the uniform grid was, even for small numbers of points, the uniform grid was worse than the Chebyshev zeros. Now, and so you do definitely use the Chebyshev zeros. Um, <clears throat> now, what I did here is I, uh, oh, whoa. Uh, oh, okay, I should have erased this stuff. I create initial, um, my, I create an initial guess. And what this initial guess does is it makes the consumption function zero at k equals zero and, it equal, and the steady state consumption at, um, at the capital stock equals one, the steady state, and then all the other coefficients set equal to zero. And then now I list the, the variables. The, vari um, the variables are a, a, the a's, but now the way Mathematica does it is what it likes to have is that it gives a, a, a table of pair, a list of pairs. Um, so here's the variable and then here's the value for the initial condition, for the initial guess. Now here's the collocation equations. Basically, I just have the equations be a list of um, the operator, basically up here, uh, OP, OPF op, this is the, this is the operator. Um, and then I, I have it equal to the collocations equations, there's four of them when degree is three. And so it's saying that the, op the operator is zero at those four points. And then I to ask Mathematica, say, okay, here's the equations and here's the variables. And what's the solution? Here's a solution. And you plot it and well, this looks nice. You have um, uh, the blue is the um, pr production function and the orange is the uh, no, 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 sorry. The orange is a production function, the blue is consumption. So basically when you're above steady state, consumption exceeds uh, uh, net output. And so anyway, so um, 
uh, here is a steady state. Now, now comes time for the Dorene no Provene, for Provene. We want to check it. We want to check that this is a good solution. So what we do is we take the operator, basically what this does, the opal x function is basically just the, the, Euler, the Euler residual operator and then slash dot sol basically uh, creates um, the, the, plugs in the unknown coefficients. Now, by the way, remember that operator was consumption today minus something. So I want to take out the consumption unit. So I take out, uh, I divide this whole thing by the steady state consumption. So this is unit free. And here, oh, look at this. Uh, here's the, um, those Euler equation residual errors. Uh, pretty good even for, I mean, this is a simple problem. So even a cubic is going to do a good job. Um, now, I'm going to do some other examples. Here I wrote up a whole big Mathematica script on it. And now here's some, here, here I use that script to do uh, this. By the way, not that you care, but you see this big white thing? In there is um, the list of all commands to solve this problem. Um, I just have erased them from display. So, um, so this is the answer we had before. Now notice, okay, now watch this. We go from degree three to degree five. Well, things are, see, is it got better. You see, this is 0004 at the top and here's 0001. So that's four times better. You gotta look, you gotta look at what's happening with the, on the left-hand scale. Now we go from the, the top number there is 0001 and now it's 00002. So this is five times better when it go to degree seven. And now it's, um, that was like two to the 10 to the minus five. And now it's another 10 times better when we go from degree seven to degree nine. And now I'm pushing my, oh yeah, I pushed my luck to degree 11 and now it's also been improved by a factor of 10. What happens if you push it too far um, beyond this, um, the um, Ill, con Ill condition is gonna, particularly when you're using ordinary polynomials, is gonna mess you up. But the, the key point here is look at how good the answer is. Um, and and as, you, as you increase the number of polynomials, as you, now by the way, notice that this is collocation. So um, this is spread out between, this is 0 0.5 and this is 1.5. Notice that the, um, that the, the collocation method had, okay, degree 11, oh, that should be, uh, no, we're good. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, at six points, the residual function is equal to zero. Um, that's not such a good picture. Anyway, uh, the this is see it, this is um, yeah. I was hoping to say that uh, the residual function is basically you know at, the residual should be equal to zero at one, but it's not. I think the key to the thing is that ten to the minus seven is basically zero to this machine. Um, so. Oh, oh, I know it. Degree nine means that there's 10 collocation points. Degree 11 means there's 12 collocation points. And so one of them is not gonna be, you're not gonna have one there. So this is a very simple example, but it follows that recipe. Define the operator, define the approximation, uh, solve out for the, um, uh, solution. Now, now comes the most serious example. I'm now going to do L1 fitting with shape constraints. I'm going to, it's the same, uh, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe that was, it's kind of the same example. Um, 
This is a Cobb Douglas in net output and log utility just to keep things from getting too ugly. Uh, here's the output function and utility function. Now here's the Euler equation error function. Euler equation, I should say Euler equation earth. Um, so um, is marginal utility of consumption today minus marginal utility of consumption tomorrow, et cetera. And now notice that uh, because since I use log and Cobb Douglas, here's the Cobb Douglas production function. Um, and um, Cobb Douglas production function here also. Um, and uh, marginal utility of log is one over C. So you have that. So you, you see what you have. Now, by the way, this is still kind of ugly, but now we got to choose our domain, point two to. 0.2 to 2, okay. Choose a domain, we're gonna do degree nine um, polynomial. We're gonna do least squares. No, we're, we're gonna to try to minimize or <coughs> the residual errors at 17 points and they're uniformly spread here. That's because I was too lazy to write down the Chevy show formulas, um, but 17 uniform points. So this is gonna be over identified. Now I'm, I, yeah, I'm not gonna display it. And then, okay, how do I do? First of all, I've got to figure, okay, list, what are my variables? Well, the A coefficients are my variables. Vars A are the coefficients, um, the variables that are coefficients of uh, this function. What I did is I took CF, which is a fu function of X. Uh, X isn't gonna be a variable, so I just plugged in a, a ir an, an ir uh, yeah, irrational number here, which means then that none, none of these are gonna be zeroed out. So anyway, then, so you're gonna get all just the variables. Ah, sorry. Now, um, and the initial, the initial values, I'm basically, I'm going to, this basically rigs it up so that the uh, initial guess for the consumption function is zero at k equals zero and is net output at um, a steady state. So this um, pins down an initial condition, which is corresponds to stable savings. Now, by the way, the, these equations have multiple, well, if, you, if I stopped here and just tried to solve collocation equations, they may have multiple solutions. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm giving it a good initial guess, and that will help. Um, and, but in this case, I'm doing a lot more things to make it help. Now, instead of trying to make sure that the Euler error is zero at a whole pile of points, uh, you see, this, this basically, um, a collocation point would not only equation would try to set, uh, try to find the uh, oil equation to be zero at some points. What we're going to do is we're going to relax this equality with a lower bound and an upper bound. Um, now, and if this is going, this, this lower bound is minus lambda L is less than or equal to the Euler residuals. Um, at a node at the ith node and is less than, which in turn is less than or equal to some upper bound. And we're gonna constrain the lambdas to be non-negative. So therefore the lower bound is gonna be a negative number, the upper bound is gonna be a positive number. What we want is that the optimization chooses the co unknown coefficients A, but also chooses the lambda so as to squeeze those lambdas down to zero. So the objective function is going to be the uh, sum of the coefficients of the, of the bounds, try and get them down to zero. And now those initial guesses, for those initial guesses, we're gonna have uh, basically give them very big numbers. Because if you give them big enough numbers, then all of these um, uh, constraints will be satisfied. And what, to find the big enough number, you just, basically plug in um, 
the, compute what the Euler equation errors are at these nodes and then take the max magnitude of the max and magnet and the and negative of the max and and that gives you uh good initial guesses that would be um make the problem surely feasible initially now what i'm also going to do is adopt some shape constraints now this is a constraint that says that even if you're at the maximum capital stock um your net output will exceed your consumption, which means that uh, you will, the capital stock will go down. Uh, on the other hand, it has to, you um, can't go too far down. And this says that at the minimum capital stock, the consumption function has to be uh, non-negative, but uh, at, the minimum capital, at the minimum capital stock, consumption is less than net output, so you are saving at that point. We're also going to impose monotonicity that basically at these node points, we're gonna have the consumption function being uh, a positive slope. Now we collect all of the variables, we collect all the, all the uh, constraints, and we solve the problem, and here's a solution. Now, the sum of the lambda, remember that there are 28, there are 14, yeah, let me do this. Uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, there are 17 po node, nodes point, nodal points used. So there's uh, 17 lambdas and seven upper lambda, 17 lower lambda. So it's 34. And so basically the sum of that is 34 times 10 to the minus six. So basically uh, each, the lambdas are pretty small. Well, you can look at it. They're all like, the biggest one is like 10 to the minus six. So, so we did a pretty good job squeezing it. But um, at, uh, so that's our solution. We trusted that this method would give us a solution, but now we verify. First, we check that the constraints that we had are, are satisfied. Uh, we define the consumption function, um, and then we create the normalized air oil. And now there, the thing is, remember in this case, the, the Euler equation that we wrote was the U prime formulation of it. And so we divide by U prime to get rid of the units. And so here's the normalized error. And notice that um, it's, it's very small. So I think we can say we successfully solved that problem. And so here's the, um, um, Here's a plot of the consumption function, and also this is the net savings function. Now, so what's the lesson here? One should use constrained optimization. You should you you should worry about shape, and you should keep the optimization problems well conditioned. Um, and sometimes, if you don't do that, you're going to run into trouble. Um, to keep things well conditioned, you should use some kind of orthogonal polynomials instead of um, instead of ordinary polynomials. Uh, but you see, the, what helped here a great deal is the con is the all the shape constraints um, that then kept things from going bad. Um, so that's the that's an example of the L one approach with shape constraints. Um, it now, my guess is that this is the way uh, things are moving. Now, when I started this stuff 30 years ago, I, I, I knew about L1 as, as a possible idea, but um, at that time, remember, so, so basically, remember, 30 years ago, 1990 when I was working on this. Remember the JET paper came out in 1992, so therefore this paper was certainly done by 1990. Um, 30 years ago means that the computers then were about um, 30,000 times slower than today. Also, you didn't have as much RAM as you can have today. 
So um, I had, to, if I was going to talk about projection methods, I had to stay with methods that could be solved um, fairly, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. And so it was critical for me in, the, in those cases, in those problems, is that I had, in those examples in that paper, that I had good initial guesses. Um, so now, though, now go to 2020, yeah, we now have computers 30,000 times faster. We also have much better software. Um, and, and I'm not talking about Mathematica. I mean, this should, really should be done using um, something like Ample or GAMS or using um, Python with Kasadi. That would make this go a whole lot faster. Um, so now our computers can handle much bigger computational tasks. And this approach is not going to have the problems that any sort of nonlinear equation approach you might have because this with the shape constraints and the inequalities you really have boxed the problem in and um you're able to keep things under control and uh and much more likely to solve the problem now by the way um this is also related to um I mean, neural nets are starting to be used to solve problems like this. And that's because hardware is a lot faster. We've, you know, I dismissed neural, the neural nets were not useful in the 90s. Um, so at that time I dismissed them. But in the meantime, computers are a whole lot faster. Um, neural nets can be massively parallelized or, I don't know about that. You can use a lot of cores on neural nets. Um, and we now understand neural nets a lot more than we do understand in the sense of empirical experience. Uh, a bit on the th some theory, but mostly it's an empirical experience. And so uh, that I think is, is a direction that some of this work is going. Um, but basically all of this is still some, the neural net stuff is, is all an example of projection methods. What you write down the unknown functions, uh, you come up with a suitable approximation for the unknown functions on the domain that you care about, and then you formulate some criterion to evaluate um, alternative choices for the coefficients, and then you have the computer grind away to find a good choice for the approximation coefficients. Um, and so it's um, different times, you're gonna have different software available to you, different um, hardware. Um, maybe if you're lucky, your GPU, your, your neural net code can actually access GPUs. So uh, as times have progressed, we can now take advantage of the speed not only to solve bigger problems, but to solve problems in a more reliable fashion, more controlled manner. Okay, so that is, um, yeah, okay. So let me see, did I miss anything? I think that's, that's it. So this is, I wanted to go through this example. Oh, by the way, this example, oh, in terms of um, homework problems, writing this up in, Whatever language you're using will be one of the you know, pro, one of your uh, problems to do um, because I want you to have experience with this um, L1 plus shape constraints um, uh, method. Um, so okay, uh, any uh, okay, I will stop the formal lecture right now. I